Our topic uh, for this presentation is Theological Perspectives on Wholeness. And our objective will be to cover the basic views of humanity that underlie the whole notion of wholeness. We can summarize the Bible's most basic description of human beings with the expression creature and image of God. And so what we'll do is to be, we'll begin by looking at the essential meaning of each of these fundamental biblical categories. Once we've done that, we will add two more that are fundamental to the biblical understanding of the human. We'll unpack those and then we'll see how fruitful they are in helping us to understand various uh, dimensions of human existence. So that's, that's where we're going. Human beings have always been their own most vexing problem. The challenges of understanding the world around us are nowhere near as complex as the challenges of understanding ourselves. And that applies even to what we might think of as the most challenging uh, uh, aspect of human thought, and that would be the doctrine of God. I was shocked once to go from a class where the professor in graduate school was known for his complex and challenging concept of God to a seminar he was teaching on the doctrine of humanity. And his beginning class, his, at the very first class, he said, I find the problems involved in thinking through the doctrine of God are nowhere near as complex as the challenges involved in thinking through the doctrine of humanity. It seems wherever we turn, there are paradoxes and potential contradictions. Think, for example, if we say human beings are simply animals and should not pretend to be more than animals, well, guess what? That implies that human beings are a very unique kind of animal with both the capacity and the inclination to pretend to be something more, right? <laughs> Other animals don't do that, so that doesn't quite work. If we say we're just plain good, fundamentally good, well, all you have to do is look at a newspaper or uh, Google anything that's happened in the news lately and you see abundant evidence for the fact that human beings are not simply good. And yet the irony is, if we weren't fundamentally good, we wouldn't be so upset by the things that we see that are violations of our goodness. So, you know, it, to say that we're simply good or simply bad won't work. So when we look at humanity, we encounter profound complexities. And to understand any aspect of human life, we need to be aware of all of the complexities. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard. I don't have any PowerPoint. I understand you've had a lot of PowerPoint. So... Uh, other people like PowerPoint. Uh, I do too, but mine have been so primitive that I've finally given up trying. All right? So I'm going to go to the whiteboard and uh, draw some circles, the most primitive form of uh, graphics, you might say, and invite you to reflect on what they tell us when we put them together about human being. And then we'll try to apply those principal categories of human existence that we find in the Bible and see how they work as a way of uh, comprehending human wholeness. Okay, let's go to the very first uh, illustr or the very first category that the uh, the Bible uses, and that will be the category of creature. Um, we'll use color coding here. All right, we'll think of uh, humans in the garden, green, other forms of life, when the earth was covered with beautiful forms of vegetation. Okay, what does it mean to be a creature? Well. When the Bible describes human origins, it places us within the realm of a creaturely environment surrounded by other forms of life. Okay? Um, according to Genesis 1, God populated the earth with various forms of beings, other beings, and uh, in uh, the seas they were filled with life as well, and then human beings came on the scene. In Genesis 2, the narrative starts with the creation of humanity, and then God says it's not good for the man to be alone, and then other forms of life come in. But either way, you've got humanity surrounded by other life forms. To be a creature is to be a form of life surrounded by other forms of life. And we, uh, we belong to the natural world. The conditions and limitations of creaturely life generally apply to us. We may depend on God ultimately for our existence, but uh, moment by moment, we're dependent on the world around us. We depend on the world around us for what we eat, the nutrition that sustains our lives. We depend on the world around us for an environment that is patient of human existence. 
uh, raise the uh, temperature too high or too low, human life cannot survive. Deprive the air of the oxygen we need and we don't last very long at all. So we're clearly finite dependent beings in a world that sustains our existence. Even though we are contingent and finite, our lives nevertheless have great value. When God finished creation, he said it is good. And when he completed creation by creating human forms, by bringing human forms into existence, he said it is very good. So finite and contingent though we are, dependent on other uh, things to sustain us, our existence is nevertheless extremely important. And this brings us to an appreciation for the body as, uh, uh, as something essential to human existence. The body in the Bible is fundamentally the way in which human beings exist. The Bible knows nothing of human existence apart from bodily existence. Uh, we can see this, for example, in the biblical descriptions of human destiny. The resurrection is the biblical description for life beyond death. Okay. And it's the resurrection of the body. So uh, that's where it appears. Bodily existence is essential to our humanity. So the Bible knows nothing of human life in disembodied form. Humanity and corporeality, to use another word for bodily existence, go together. Furthermore, we not only have bodies, we are bodies. So although the Bible affirms the importance of the body, it does not exaggerate it. It never reduces people to their physical appearance or their physical condition. So for the Bible writers, a person is never merely a body, never merely a physical organism. But on the other hand, the body is of great importance because not only because it's vital to our existence, but because it is the bearer of great meaning. I like to use the expression, the body is the symbol of the person. And when I use that expression, I have in mind a distinction that Paul Tillich made, the great uh, Protestant theologian of one of the great ones of the uh, 20th century, uh, he, he described a symbol as something that points beyond itself. A sign does that too. But whereas a sign is purely, uh, so we say, contrived, a symbol participates in that to which it points. Okay? So a symbol is, shall we say, integral to the reality to which it points. Okay? If the body is the symbol of the person, it indicates that there's something more here that's represented by the body, and yet to say, well, we have the more, forget the body, wouldn't work because the body participates in the person. So you see the connection there? So we don't reduce a person to the body, but we don't dispense with the body because there's a person that's, shall we say, of greater significance. And so this, as you can see, has immense significance for uh, treating people who may have physical challenges or who are sick or whatever, the body, whatever the condition of the body, it still symbolizes something beyond it. Okay? So we should neither diminish nor exaggerate the significance of the body as a physical form. All of this, I think, is suggested by the notion of creature. As creatures, uh, we have this significance. Our physical form, our physical appearance, our physical relationships, uh, and so on, all have uh, something additional in significance. Now, what is that? Well, that leads us to the very next category. And I'm going to make these as concentric circles, to, and I'll explain why in just a moment. The next, I'm using blue here to suggest transcendence, shall we say. Uh, the blue would indicate, or would, would, uh, the category here is image of God. Human beings are creatures, but also bearers of the divine image. Now, what's involved in that notion of image of God? We don't know for sure. Okay. It's been no biblical category has received greater attention out of proportion to the number of times it occurs in the Bible than this expression, image of God. Okay. Very few times, and yet somehow it's uh, been taken to identify what it is that gives us our uniqueness. Well, exactly what is it? Well, some would say because being created in the image of God uh, was followed by God saying, let them have dominion, that being in the image of God means that human beings have a position of authority over other forms of life, over the material world in which we exist. 
So we have the capacity and the responsibility of organizing and utilizing the resources, the material resources of the world around us. That would be one. Another possibility, and one that's more uh, widely uh, explored, is that there is some quality within human life that distinguishes us from other forms of life. Okay, there's something about us that's different. And many different possibilities have been used. The one that's most popular is reason. What is there about human beings that distinguishes us from others? Well, we are creatures of reason. Okay. We can think things through. We are capable of abstract thought. We may be in this room physically, and yet our mind's taking us to the mountains, <laughs> or the beach, <laughs> or somewhere else. Not that we'd rather be there than here, but you understand, you know, we can, we can reason. We can abstract from the immediate surroundings. Um, now, it took a while for this to develop. I'm told, for example, that the Egyptians were great measurers, calculators, because every time the Nile flooded, they had to go out and, you know, re reconfigure the, uh, the territory uh, where the fields were, what fields belonged to whom. Geometry. Well, it was the Greeks who realized you didn't have to be measuring things to understand the relationship between lines and circles and angles and so on. And so geometry can be a very abstract thing. You can do geometry sitting in a, uh, in, in a room. You don't have to be out with tape measures and things like that. So what were they doing? Well, they were using reason, you see, um, to calculate things, mathematics and so forth. So reason is a is a candidate for what it is that distinguishes us from other forms of life. Another one is imagination. Some people have said reason doesn't quite cover it. Imagination is what distinguishes us because with human beings you can never calculate the uh, the extent to which we can come up with new ideas. Okay. Uh, the, very, the very things we depend on day by day, computers, iPhones, and so on. Well these frankly, are novelties to someone like me who has spent decades <laughs> uh, teaching. When I started out, an electric typewriter was the state-of-the-art business equipment. Okay, Now look what's happened, all right? We use things like, how did this all come about? Through imagination, see? through the ability to see beyond what's here around us and beyond the natural response to it to something that's much more encompassing. So imagination takes us beyond. Uh, it goes on. Some people would say what makes us unique is freedom. Unlike other forms of life, which seem to be reacting based on the, uh, the nature that they're given when they come into the world, human beings have the freedom, uh, the capacity to determine their own course in life. This is usually uh, taken to refer to moral freedom. Human beings are capable of right and wrong, capable of seeing our obligations and fulfilling them or failing to fulfill them. So that, that is often what freedom is understood as. Freedom, of course, I think in another sense can be uh, thought of as, as what we just talked about, imagination. Uh, the capacity for self-determination. Why have you chosen the course in life that you have chosen? Could you have done something else? Well, you probably look back and say, well, yeah, I had options. I had alternatives available, but this is the course I chose. Why are you doing what you're doing? because I chose to do it. See, so this capacity for self-determination may be part of what's involved in the image of God. Another important term would be this uh, rather complex and sometimes controversial idea of spirituality. Okay. What is spirituality? Well, in its most fundamental form, it probably has to do with our awareness of and openness to the mystery and meaning of the universe. Okay. It's been said, Animals inhabit an environment that is a physical situation that provides them their needs and their, you know, gives them a place to, uh, uh, to dwell. Uh, human beings don't inhabit an environment. Okay? We inhabit a world. What's the difference between an environment and a world? Well, a world is a structure of meaning. Okay? We are not simply citizens of whatever country we reside in or were born in but rather we see ourselves as belonging to the whole universe. Right? Um, what's the name of the uh, landing on Mars? Isn't it curiosity? Is that what that, uh, that maneuvering thing is called? I'm sorry, I don't have the right word for it. Uh, but the idea is, you know, Earth is not enough for our, our range of interests. We must go to the moon and beyond uh, and send uh, space 
exploration out into the universe to figure out why? Well, because we have uh, a larger scope for our, our interests than that. So here we are. There's one more thing we should mention, um, and that would be emotions or feelings. Now, I put it here with image of God, although I think it's true that other forms of life have feelings and emotions as well. It's, it's very difficult here because we, we naturally have a tendency, especially when it comes to our pets, to anthropomorphize, you know, to attribute human qualities. You've probably heard of people talking about their favorite dog as being sad or disappointed or embarrassed or something like that. Probably not, but still, we, uh, we do attribute feelings, and I think there's some indication that the feelings are there. And certainly, our feelings will be related to our physical condition, right? You notice that? You haven't eaten for a long time, and you have a good meal. Does it affect your feelings? Yeah, okay. So, uh, um, if you've been not well for a while, and then you recover, and you're having a good day, uh, you know, you can see how feelings uh, sort of on the borderline between image of God and creature. Feelings may have more to do with the quality of life than, than many other things. So that's important. Now, it's interesting to notice that these two categories are intimately related to each other. Okay? That's why I put creature inside image of God. It's not that our creatureliness sits on one level like the bottom layer of a cake, and then image of God sits on top as something totally different. No, there's an intimate and intricate connection between the two, so that everything about us in a creaturely way is now transposed and transformed by being part of some larger reality. And everything creaturely about us can assume a significance beyond its mere biological value. Think, for example, of food. Okay. Why do we eat? Well, obviously, without sufficient nutrition, we can't survive, so we eat to live. Is that all that eating means to us? Not by any means. Partaking of food is an immensely meaningful activity. It's often a social occasion. See. Uh, people often have meals to celebrate important events in their lives, weddings, <laughs> anniversaries, things like that. Why, what, what does eating together do? Well, it does more than just meet our physical needs. It also serves social needs, see. So what we've got here is a creaturely activity, a creaturely need being infused, as it were, by additional significance or, if you want to put it the other way, being elevated to a higher level of meaning and purpose and value. Uh, sometimes women say, I knew our relationship was moving to a higher level when he asked me out to dinner the first time. And I said, well, maybe lunch before we get to dinner. Well, you get the picture here, okay? I mean, let's, <laughs> let's not put too much significance in this activity. But, but the, the, the picture is there. Uh, if you have ever been uh, a guest in someone's home, especially from a culture where offering something to eat is, is, is very important. You know how significant it was to that person that you accept their hospitality and enjoy it, see, because eating with someone communicates something significant uh, and important. Well, that just touches on the intricacy here. Uh, we could go on. Uh, something uh, that's also of great significance is uh, what neuroscience or cognitive science is telling us about the very structure of our cognitive abilities. Okay. The categories with which we think are intimately related to being physical beings in a physical world. Okay. One of the sort of universal metaphors that people use is the metaphor good is up and bad is down. Now we use that so commonly that we don't ever think of it as a metaphor, but actually what it does is, is, is communicate the idea that it is better to be up than to be down. We use it when it comes to emotions. How are you feeling today? I'm on top of the world. Or as opposed to, oh, I've really been low lately. I don't know why. You know. We use it when it comes to morals. She has very high standards. That was a dirty, low-down thing to do. We use it when it comes to organization and power. You know, he's top man on the totem pole. You know. Boy, has he slipped. <laughs> you know, see what I mean? We use it when it comes to religion. What's backsliding? You know, see what I mean? Well, what is this? Well. There are different ways of explaining where this would come from and why, but one might be when you're healthy, you're up and around, and when you're sick, 
or you've lost your life, you're down, you're low. You, you, you see the, the, the relationship here. So our very categories of thought are not somehow separated from what it is to be a physical being in a physical world. Now, the third category is in some ways the most difficult to understand and the most complex. And that is the category of sin, which we put here. <laughs> because sin affects all there is of us, <laughs> and it affects every one of us. Uh, sin has generated a great m a deal of serious theological reflection. But it points to the fact that there is a tragic flaw in human existence between what we're meant to be and what we actually are. And uh, to cite a couple of classical expressions related to sin, we've got the notion of uh, original sin. Uh, I don't think we have to, s to see that as somehow making us all guilty from the very beginning, but what it points to is the fact that everybody is involved. Everybody's affected by sin. Nobody is immune from it. And then there's another one, total depravity. Now here again, total depravity doesn't mean that we're just as bad as we could possibly get. It just means that sin affects everything there is about us. So it affects all of us, and it affects everything there is about us. And so, being creatures in the image of God and also being sinners means that there is no aspect of our existence that isn't somehow affected by this distorting, undermining quality at the same time. While sin affects everything about us, it does not completely eliminate anything essential to us or we would stop being humans. See what I mean? So uh, that's the complexity here. We're still humans. We're still in the image of God. And yet as sinners, no aspect of our existence, physical, mental, spiritual, or whatever, is everything it's meant to be. There's always uh, some sort of illness, if you will. Okay. And that's why uh, sickness or illness naturally becomes a kind of way of talking about uh, sin and its effects, a close relationship. Um, it's been said that no religion has a higher estimate of human stature and a lower estimate of human virtue than Christianity. Okay. You see, the problem is not our identity. It's not our makeup. It's not our finitude, if you will. The problem is our spiritual condition. And there is a, an irreversibility about this. Shall we say, uh, to some extent, a, a, a hopelessness about it. <laughs> that is to say, this is a problem that we cannot solve ourselves. See? And so things have to be, uh, have to change. So, sin creates a conflict in human existence that affects everything about us. Okay. We oftentimes find our appetites in conflict with what our mind knows we really need. Have you ever eaten something that you really didn't need, <laughs> that wouldn't serve your purposes nutritionally, and so forth? Okay? So we find a disparity, a conflict there. We may recognize something as our duty. And then we discover we just don't have the willpower to do it. Yeah, I know I should, but, you know, I just don't want to, kind of a thing. Uh, we find ourselves in conflict with other people. Very hard to be the people uh, with others that we wanted to be, to provide the companionship and so on. And then, of course, we find ourselves in conflict with God. Okay. We may know that God is what we need more than anything else, and yet competing with that desire for God, which is there, our other desires and so on. So we find ourselves divided. We find ourselves in conflict. So it's, I, I, I think of a, a, a model of sin as something like a, 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 an automobile, <laughs> which has all of its parts, but just doesn't quite work right. You know, they never quite work the way they're supposed to. So everything's there that's essential. Nothing's been taken away, but it's just not functioning right. It doesn't serve transportation needs. So that's where we are. Okay, Each of us is uh, involved in uh, self-destructive activity in one way or another. We're set against ourselves. We're in conflict with ourselves, with others, and with God. And that brings us happily to the last of these categories, and that would be
uh, salvation or grace, if you will. My color code kind of got away from me. I meant to put sin in black, so if you want to recode, <laughs> all right, that would make more sense, wouldn't it? So here we are. Sin affects everything about us, but it's not the last word. As soon as sin became a part of the human condition, God responded to it by sending salvation and grace into the world. And so just as nothing about us is purely an expression of sin, okay, uh, grace affects everything there is about us. And that's another complication. Now, how might this work? Let, let's just draw this in a couple of, maybe we can apply it to just perhaps one thing. Let's apply this to something we're all involved in, and that would be the activity of work, gainful employment. Okay. How does this work? Well, what we want to do is take uh, this particular aspect of human life. You wouldn't be here if you weren't uh, committed to doing useful things with your life. Okay, so what are you doing? What kind of work are you doing? Okay. We're going to look at work through each of these four lenses. What does work represent? Well, like all creatures, we need food, we need a place to stay, and uh, we need to provide for our young, right? Well, why do we work? Well, because I need a job. Why? Because I need money. What are you going to do with the money? I'm going to pay the bills. Eh? I'm going to pay the grocery bill. I'm going to pay the rent. I'm going to provide a place for my uh, kids, my family to live, and so on. So creature, work takes care of that. But work is never just getting that done. It's not just drudgery. It shouldn't be. Work is a way in which we express ourselves. It's a way in which we acquire meaning and significance. See? Uh, work is a way of uh, achieving your fulfillment as a human being. Okay. So work uh, has the effect of, of uh, opening us up and giving us ways of expressing ourselves. How does sin affect work? Work is a positive thing, but it can easily degenerate into something degrading. If you think of words like labor and then toil, okay. if work is energizing and effective, have you done something you really enjoyed, work that, you know, fulfilling some of your responsibilities, and you discovered that fulfilled you and that energized you, and you were just as excited about it at the end of the day as you were at the start, okay? Work is meant to do that. Labor deprives you <laughs> of energy. Toil may deprive you of a sense of significance, and there are forms of activity inflicted on people. Think of things like slavery, slave labor, that are specifically intended to degrade the person, to take away a sense of meaning and significance. Okay. So work can be degrading and demeaning. On the other hand, sin may lead us to exaggerate the significance of work. Why? Well, we may tend to identify a person with what they do. Okay. Do you notice in our culture how we do that? If you read about somebody in the paper or hear about somebody on newscast, inevitably they connect that person with some occupation. Now, they may have been retired for 25 years, but a retired school teacher, <laughs> you get the picture? <laughs> uh, living such and such. What, what, do we, uh, what, what question do we ask little kids when we're trying to get acquainted with them and let them know we care about them? They may be five or six years old. What do we almost instinctively ask them? What would you like to be when you grow up? Exactly. What do you want to be when you grow up? It's as if to say, you know, a 90-year-old person or a five-year-old <laughs> is not just where they are significant as a human being. They must have been something important because they worked, or they're going to do something important because they will work. You see what we do. And then, along with this, goes the tendency to exaggerate the significance of people based on what they do, or diminish the significance of people based on what they do. So certain occupations don't carry a lot of social prestige. Others do, maybe beyond. So, so the... Uh, uh, you can see how sin affects this fundamental aspect of human life. Okay. What does salvation do when it comes to work? It redeems it. Famous passage in the book of Ephesians where Paul is talking to slaves and then to their masters. 
And it's very interesting what he says. Now, it's important to remember, in the ancient world, in the Mediterranean world, slaves were property. The ancient uh, sort of business contracts, property transfer, referred to slaves sometimes with just the Greek word for body, soma, as if to say slaves are just bodies. <laughs> They're reduced to their capacity to produce physical activity. And Paul says to slaves, he says, listen, be obedient to earthly masters, but serve as you, you were serving Christ. See? So it's as if to say your occupational activity does not define the significance of your work because you can be serving Christ. See? So it gives an elevated uh, significance to the work that's done. And then, of course, the Sabbath is a reminder that none of us should be equated with the work we do during the week. There's something about us that transcends what we do to earn a living. And on the Sabbath, as described in the Ten Commandments, even slaves, if you will, servants were to be set free, which indicates that in God's eyes, there is a sense in which all human beings occupy the same level. Okay. We all have dignity and significance. We're not to be identified by the work that we do or what we do to earn a living. Uh, and the Sabbath also could be understood as giving significance to what we do during the week. Okay. Um, so that's what, uh, that's what salvation does and uh, to the concept of work. It gives it a significance and a value, and it helps us to appreciate the significance and value of other people as well. Now, when we think about human wholeness, when we think about these various categories, uh, I think we're brought inevitably to the ministry of Jesus during his lifetime to the people around him. And when we look at his ministry, we see that Jesus spoke to every aspect of human need. Uh, Jesus met people's physical needs. Two-thirds of his miracles, the ones that are specifically described, were involved in healing and responding to physical illness or infirmity of one, of one sort or another. He cured blindness, deafness, leprosy, and paralysis. Um, he also provided people with food when they needed it. So Jesus was clearly concerned about people's physical needs. Of course, it never stopped there. <laughs> Jesus was interested in their spiritual needs as well. So the, the multi-level quality of human life was something we see in the ministry of Jesus as, as what he addressed. Physical needs, spiritual needs. He was primarily concerned with restoring people to a proper relationship with God. And it's interesting the way he saw a connection between physical condition and spiritual condition. So he would forgive sin and then heal in close proximity. Remember the paralytic in Capernaum. He said, your sins are forgiven, then rise up and walk. That order is reversed later when uh, the man born blind in John 9, his blindness is healed, is or let's say his sight is restored. And then later on, Jesus reveals the significance of his own identity to the man. So it's as if he meets his physical need and then addresses his spiritual needs. So the whole person, see, physical and spiritual, united, is addressed uh, by Jesus. But it's also significant to see that Jesus uh, also addressed people's other needs. For example, Jesus was sensitive to people's emotions or feelings. He was concerned about them. Uh, he commended a poor widow for putting a mere pittance in the temple treasury. He upheld Mary for choosing the better part. When Martha, her sister, complained that she wasn't doing enough to help around the house with more domestic uh, tasks. He comforted a woman harshly accused of adultery by assuring her, neither do I condemn you. And he ate with tax collectors and sinners, <laughs> mystifying both his followers and his uh, critics. So it shows that Jesus reached out to establish uh, uh, connections with people in a way that spoke to their emotional needs. And then uh, perhaps most important of all, Jesus spoke to, be, to, to people's social needs. He recognized that whatever we say about the significance of the individual, there is something even more important, and that is the significance of the community to which we belong. Now, this aspect of biblical understanding of the human, our social identity, is something that's difficult, I've 
I believe, for people in American society, conventional American society, to appreciate. Because we place so much emphasis on individual accomplishment and individual achievement. Okay. Why do we do that? Well, clearly it affirms the value of each human being. But it does so to such an extent that communal relationships, social bonds, are regarded as completely dispense, you know, we can dispense with them uh, in the name of, so, of personal achievement. And uh, so what we've got here is a kind of commitment to individualism that makes community very difficult. What Jesus did was create a new kind of community where people could participate no matter what their background, no matter what their ethnicity, no, even their, no matter what moral pedigree they had, wherever they'd come. Uh, Jesus reached out to them and created a new humanity. So when we think about wholeness and its theological basis, let's think of the four fundamental biblical categories, creature, image of God, sin, and salvation. And then let's also be aware of the extent to which Jesus spoke to the full range of human needs in his own ministry. And I think with those two basic uh, perspectives, We'll have an understanding of the human that will provide us a, a foundation for looking at all the specific things that Christianity has reason to be concerned with.